All right, so second session of this morning. Uh, we are going to uh, continue to talk about fire dynamics, I think, fire behavior. Uh, we are going to have a double feature. <laughs> Mark Finney and Jason Fordhofer from uh, the Missoula Fire Sciences uh, Laboratory uh, and from the Forest Service. And with this, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arno. Thanks, everybody. This has been a really great, great course, great session, great interactions. Really glad that we were able to participate here and uh, enjoyed the conversations with everybody at break time and dinner. So anyway, thanks. Um, so this is kind of a, a break, but also a segue from Professor Villegas' talk this morning. So he talked about extreme fire behavior and dynamic fires, right, and showed a lot of complexity in terms of the way fires can be configured and behave on landscapes. But if you see the video playing in the background of the title slide, we're going to talk about something completely different, much more basic than that, and that is just simple fires, simple surface fires, okay, and how they spread. And you can learn a lot by watching this video over and over and over again. That's why I got it on the loop. Um, but uh, these fires were lit at exactly the same time. Jason and I and some other people were out there lighting, lit exactly at the same time. And you can see that the, the point ignition fire spreads a lot more slowly and is accelerating more slowly than the line ignition fire, okay? We would hope that uh, our models, our practical models in the future would be able to explain this, okay, and represent this to people who are in the field. We would want to do that. At, at present, none of the operational models will show that. Right? We, have, we know it happens, right? It's been documented, but there's a lot of other features here we'd like to, like someday, to be able to include in operational models. So Jason and I and Sarah both all work for the U.S. Forest Service, which is a very applied agency, right? Our, our goals, of course, are doing research in order to support land management. And so we've got a very practical, uh, practical bent on, the, on things, not just doing fundamental research. So um, one of the things that... Uh, we're trying to do is understand fire behavior well enough to produce next generation fire spread models that are practical for field people. And so some of the characteristics that we'd like to include in this um, I've got listed up here. Um, so for, for example, applying just to a simple surface fire here under the probably the most uniform and constant conditions that you can get in the field, right? We have wheat stubble, uh, uh, crop stubble, it's all is the same. There's a few tire tracks there and things, but same moisture content, very, very uh, consistent wind, uh, about four meters per second. Um, you can see differences from point in the line ignitions, right? The spread rates for the heading, flanking, and backing fires are very, very different along with their intensity. We'd like to be able to represent this physically, and that, believe it or not, that's, that's still a challenge. Um, look at the fire shape. Look at the point ignition and then the shape of the heading portion of the, of the line ignition. Uh, remarkable how close that is to an ellipse, a, a mathematical ellipse. Why is that? No one's explained that yet. We, we, we're using the mathematics of it because it's convenient, but we don't have a physical explanation for the fire shape under uniform and constant conditions. You'd think at this stage of the game, 2023, we would have that physical explanation. We do not. Oops, wrong one here. All right, so what I'm going to do today is provide a little background for what Jason's going to talk about, and he's going to talk about a simplified approach to fire spread modeling having physical fidelity to the processes we can measure in the laboratory um, and in the field. I'm going to give a brief history, talk about the applications for modeling um, that we hope to be able to support, um, and then the challenges that we face in developing practical physical models. So humans and fire. Let's just put all of this in perspective. I, I think history is fascinating and it's very important for our perspective um, on how we got to where we are now, right? There's been a lot of people that have existed and thought about problems before us. It's important to understand what they understood and how they approach things so that we know where we are right now. Um, so for about a half a million years or so, people have been using fire for heating, lighting, and cooking, you know, domestic kind of fire uses. Uh, anthropologists tell us that maybe for about the last 80,000 years or so, people started using fire for foraging, they call it, for hunting, for warfare, for all sorts of things, but they are controlling on a landscape basis. Aboriginals in Australia, there's various 
timelines there, but you know, 50,000 years, 80,000 years using fire, burning the entire continent really on a regular basis. Um, in the Americas, somewhere between 13,000 and 20,000 years, they keep pushing back the, the dates. They think that people arrived here after the ice melted in the north. Um, for the last 6,000 years, the vegetation composition has been roughly the constant, roughly. Um, so, you know, the things you're seeing now um, have been that way for a long time. It's only in the last 150 to 200 years, more or less, uh, more in some places, less than others, that European uh, discovered the new world and settlement occurred, right, displacing indigenous people. Um, and it's really only in the last 100 years or so that we've had an organized approach to fire suppression. Before that, we didn't fight fire because we couldn't. We weren't deluded in thinking we could control it. And so we used it instead of, instead of uh, uh, trying to suppress it. So where, where do you think fire modeling occurs on this timeline? What, what slice of half a million years do you think? Well, it's, it's, less, than, it's less than 100 years now. That's deceiving. I need to, need to get rid of this thing. Okay. Um, so I just want to put a plug in for uh, the, the, our predecessors in a lot of these places, the indigenous peoples. They were experts at fire. They didn't have any fire models. They didn't have computers or math, but they had tremendous experience, and they learned from that. It's a way of knowing that's different than Western science. But they used fire very expertly, and they lived with it. You know, they thrived uh, in fire environments in Australia, in the United States, uh, in, in North America, um, and a couple of great books. I mean, The Biggest Estate on Earth by Bill Gamage talks about the aboriginal, the, the incredibly complex way that the aborigines in Australia burned that landscape. Forgotten Fires is a book by Homer Stewart um, on the same kind of thing in, in the Americas, or in North America. So, Fast forward to the last little tiny slice of history. Uh, last hundred years, more or less, the Forest Service was created in 1905 with the transfer of lands from the Department of Interior to the Department of Agriculture. And with that brought what we call professional management, or they called it, okay. But it made the application of European forestry principles to the U.S. Um, and, and much North America, actually. But um, what this did is it, it replaced Indian burning, settlement burning, and natural fires, the objectives were to grow timber, okay? There was this presumption that removing fire was going to be successful in sustaining these ecosystems for various kinds of uses. It's not an ecology-based thing. It wasn't based on understanding of ecology in those days because they didn't really have an understanding of the, the fire dynamics, the way the things that Sarah talked about with the fire ecology of all of these native forests, okay? Suppression uh, was an integral part of this management, keeping fire out just like they did in the wetter parts of Europe. Um, and fire control became the dominant paradigm after 1910, being codified in the 10 a.m. policy in, in the Great Depression. Um, this was about fire control. It was not about fire management. And as a consequence of trying to remove 98% of all the fires before they get to 300 acres, we have what we call a fire deficit. And I don't have a map for, for all of the areas that this has been applied, but for, for the United States, this is a ratio of modern to historical burning. So all of the places on a log scale, all the places in green and blue, were burning about five to ten times less than we used to burn historically during the, the, the indigenous occupancy. Um, all the places that are in yellow and red were burning about five to ten times more. And the reason for that is invasive grasses. We have all these annual grasses, and those are desert ecosystems. And normally the fuels were so sparse and disconnected and, uh, by patches of bare ground, the fires couldn't spread very often. But now we have all this invasive annual grass that makes a continuous mat of dry grass and it's able to burn every year sometimes, and that kills off everything that can't, can't take it. So things have changed uh, in the United States and throughout the world because of uh, the management policy. So I'm going to present, present a brief, uh, very brief history of uh, wildland fire modeling. Uh, it's going to omit more than it certainly conveys, but it'll give you a, just a, a sampling of the things that people have thought about um, uh, before our time here. So initially, because of the emphasis on fire control, that's really where the interest in fire research began. People saw fires as destructive. We want to have research that helps us control fires. It wasn't about modeling spread. It was about control, right? What do we need to control? And, and initially, the, the, the efforts were aimed at um, what was called fire danger. Okay? And the fire danger is 
you compare that with fire behavior here, it's relative indices correlated with spread, ignition, uh, suppressibility of fire, basically just the amount of fire suppression business that takes place. We need an index to say, uh, when is it dangerous to have campfires, right? When do we need to have additional fire crews in order to be able to control fire on the landscape? And so they were after fire danger rating indices. These are not, it's, it's a, it's a uh, ratio scale, uh, but it is not, it's not, they're relative indices, right? So a, sc a score of 20 or 50 or something, yeah, it's twice as much as 25, but it doesn't really mean anything in terms of local conditions. And these were intended to, fire danger is intended to be applied at very broad scales, not for a point. Fire behavior on their hand is very localized. It's quantitative metrics for how fast, how long, and how, um, uh, uh, how far fires move. Basically, that's what fire behavior is. And very, very specific, um, very specific in scale. So the early research, uh, what it ended up doing in the early part of the 20th century was to identify the main factors and roughly try to establish correlations between these main factors like moisture and wind, um, <coughs> sun, canopy cover, topography, and fire activity, right? Just exploring um, those that space, all those variables. One of the principal things they were after is fire growth, that is fire perimeter growth, because they're not trying to contain fires. You don't really care how fast the fire is moving, you care how fast the fire perimeter is expanding. Yeah, it's linear related, um, depending on the shape, but if, if you're gonna get there in an hour, you wanna know how much line you have to construct in order to contain that fire. So a little bit of a background um, on Missoula, right? We all work for Missoula Fire Sciences Laboratory. And this is the, the main wildland fire laboratory in the Forest Service for doing fire behavior and, and fire research. And the reason it's in Missoula has a lot to do with uh, the history. Okay, once again, history. But it started in 1910. Uh, Sarah talked about the 1910 fires, three million acres uh, burned along the Idaho-Montana divide, really scared and alarmed the Congress of the United States, and they started putting money towards fire research. We had some of the first fire research in the entire agency. It was conducted in 1915 by Harry Gisborne. We'll talk about that in a minute. We had a major disaster called the Man Gulch Fire, where 13 firefighters were killed um, by a fire spreading up this canyon um, in 1949. And the interest in fire behavior and fire research was really uh, um, exploited in order to build the lab in Missoula, Montana, which is a very small town in the West, uh, in, by 1960. Yeah. Seemed to want to flip on it by itself. Interesting. Um, so we've had the lab there since 1960. We have wind tunnel. We have burn chambers. We do a lot of basic fire research. So I mentioned Harry Harry Gisborne, um, and he was working out of Missoula uh, to develop fire danger rating. As I said, in 1928, measuring forest fire danger in northern Idaho. And this is really a great report. 28, 1928, that's almost 100 years ago. And you can see one of the results there showing Duff moisture content on the y-axis is a function of air temperature. And he's got up there um, on the, along the top axis there, you know, generally, these are qualitative categories, right, for fire danger rating, generally safe all the way to, up to extremely dangerous, right? It's funny how it goes generally safe to slightly dangerous. I mean, there's, there's nothing in between safe and dangerous. And it's kind of funny. But anyway, the qualitative uh, rankings. Uh, in Canada, similar kinds of efforts were going on contemporaneously. Uh, 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 James Wright and Herbert Beale were developing relationships between moisture content of various kind of forest fuels and weather, which is still the foundation of the Canadian Fire Weather Index today, right? It was done about a century ago. Um, okay. Um, Hornby, 1936. So that's 90-odd that's, uh, years ago wrote this nice paper called Fire Control Planning in the Northern Rocky Mountain Region. And take a look at that color map there on the right. What's interesting about that is it combines two different characteristics that they were concerned about for control. One is spread rate. Okay, so they're starting to think that, okay, the faster fires spread, the harder they are to control, the more damaging they might be, right? So they're actually mapping pieces of ground in terms of potential spread rate, which is kind of interesting, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not relating exactly weather to that, but it's showing that they were concerned about spread rate, but they also mapped it by resistance to control. So the shading part of that shows resistance to control. So this was all about control. This was not about prescribed burning. It was not about ecology. It was about how do we better map out the landscape 
figure out what we need to do in order to control fire and stop it. But still, they were thinking about fire behavior and fire danger. Um, Curry and Fonz, 1938, uh, fascinating study for that time. Yes, that is a wind tunnel out in the woods um, on the left-hand side. Uh, uh, Wally Fonz was an engineer with the Forest Service in California at the time, and uh, he built this portable wind tunnel, and they took it out in the field, assembled it out there, and they did pine needle uh, burning experiments out there, which is pretty fast. I think that's the first wind tunnel uh, employed for fire uh, spread research. And they burned pine needles primarily. Um, they came up with a lot of interesting things. Uh, you know, they took a look at on the on the x-axis on the left-hand chart. There is uh, the porosity, that is the volume of the fuel bed per unit surface area of the fuel. And they noticed that finer fuel particles in more open beds spread faster. Okay, so they were developing these quantitative statistical relationships, but they also were looking at the shape of fires. So a lot of our uh, understanding about fire shape developed during this time, you're seeing um, where you have a, a spreading, a, a wind-driven fire on the right-hand side and the lower right, uh, you see it's kind of an elliptical blob right there, okay? There's very, very small scale for pine needle experiments. And that is something that's really remarkable about the elliptical fire shape. Um, in general, it appears at all scales, right? Literally the scale of this desktop here on pine needles as well as over uh, tens of thousands of hectares, the same shape appears, which is really an interesting, interesting thing that hasn't been explained. So 1951, uh, Jack Barrows, he's actually the individual most responsible for getting the, the Missoula Fire Lab built in 1960, uh, exploiting the interest in uh, the disaster from 1949 and getting that built. But he wrote a paper in 1951. This, this is very relevant to today. Look at the introduction or the, the, the contents here. You have uh, principles of combustion weather, topography, fuels, and then fire behavior rating. I mean, this book is still very current from 1951, and there's still a lot of really good qualitative information in there, right? Look at, look at figure four. A loose pile of sticks ignites more easily than a tightly packed bundle because more surface area of the fuel exposed to air. You know, the ex explanation is not exactly right, but it's, it's, it's right enough to be practical in, in, to, to fire managers, right? Talking about radiation, they have a lot of other principles in there that are still, still very, very valid. Um, and in the, in the end of that, they have what was state-of-the-art at the time in terms of fire spread prediction. So this is a table. On the left-hand columns is the fuel type. Uh, then there is basically the fuel amount in the next column over. Continuity. Of course, he was recognizing that continuity, with how disrupted it is, how, much, how patchy it is, really has a major effect on fire spread. So once you start factoring in combinations of all these fuel characteristics, and you, you take a look how much how many snags. A snag is a dead is a dead tree, standing dead tree, okay, for spotting. Uh, you had this qualitative ranking where it's uh, you know you can see there high, medium, low, extreme. That's about as good as they could hope to do for spread rate um, in 1951. Right? They didn't have any illusions that they were going to be able to predict quantitatively the spread rate, um, uh, even even through empirical means. So eventually, though. Eventually, though, there was this transition from a focus on fire danger to fire behavior. People started understanding more. We started to have more technology and more tools. And, and concomitantly with this, this transition, or maybe even because of it, uh, fire management needs and interests started to shift too. Okay? It, it's kind of a coupled system where management gets interested in things because they're possible. Uh, they're possible by, as demonstrated by research, and so there's kind of this cycle of ever-increasing expectation for research products, and so we move towards fire behavior prediction. And uh, uh, this happened in Canada, it happened in Australia, and in the United States with the advent of the Rothschild spread equation, a number of speakers have talked about it. I'm going to talk about it just a little bit here. Um, I, I encourage you to, to read the report. Um, if you'd like, but the, the Rothschild spread equation was really a milestone in, in fire research. We still use it today. It's the bedrock of the American uh, uh, fire danger rating system as well as fire behavior prediction system. And <clears throat> it was basically began with a whole bunch of laboratory experiments uh, in Missoula, just basically exploring how all these factors were related, taking physical measurements. Franzen, uh, Bill Franzen in 1971 published a, uh, a theoretical framework for this, which I'll go over in a second. And Rothermill published uh, 1972 uh, Fire Spread 
it was initially driven by national interest in having a national danger rating system. So once again, danger rating was the, was the goal because there had been all these regional danger rating systems and so uh, they were in conflict. They didn't produce the same kind of indications of fire danger. And so at a national level, the Forest Service was like, we need a national danger rating system. And so that's what really what drove Rothmel to do and his team to do what they did. Okay. Albini came along in 1976 and says, heck with that, we're going to expand this in order into fire behavior. So Franzen, I mentioned him before, but basically he came up with this, this uh, energy balance approach towards a steady state, predicting steady state spread. And the, to cut the whole story short, basically it's a, it's a ratio of the propagating flux, the amount of energy released per unit area, uh, per unit time, um, by the fire and the amount that's required for ignition out in front. And if you look at the units there, basically through a bunch of cancellation, uh, you get uh, a, a rate of propagation, meters per second. Okay? Um, and so this propagating flux is in the, in the numerator and the amount of heat absorbed per unit volume of fuel bed is in the denominator. Okay. Well, the problem with this is that it can't be evaluated analytically. Okay? And so Rothermill and his team uh, set about to do a bunch of experiments to basically parameterize it. And the, the form of the equation and the terms are a little different than what Franzen had. But basically, um, uh, what Dick did, Dick Rothermill, is he, he used experiments because the heat flux terms for which the mechanisms of heat transfer were not known. There's no way to analytically, an, analytically figure that out. So there's Dick um, and at the bottom there. And if you're interested, uh, he gave a, a very short lecture uh, in response to the invitation from Professor Vegas uh, last fall, um, uh, where he received an award, 50 years, this equation has been going, and, uh, and so he uh, gave a little bit of a historical rundown on how he developed this equation, okay, and so it's on the, on the website, go ahead and click on it. Um, pretty interesting. Um, he's 93 and still going strong. So there's a lot of different experiments, I'm not going to go into them, but that, uh, there's a lot of different experiments that came into play to help pr pr provide empirical relations that are embedded within that overall equation. Well, 1976, that was translated into practical user, uh, end user application uh, by Frank Albini. And so, does everybody know what the, see that middle publication, you know what that, uh, what that stuff is in there? It's are punch cards. Right. That's the kind of computing technology that we had back then, and what I learned program computer on too. Um, but uh, anyway, what Frank was able to do was translate this into uh, nomograms. So basically, you took Rothmel spread equation, and there's a nomogram, and you can wind your way through that, putting in all the fuel inputs and the weather and the moisture and the slope, and you can end up with a spread rate and intensity, which is really pretty fascinating. So that's the way they had to do it. Um, and if you do that repeatedly across the fire front, uh, and Dominguez showed this here just a moment ago, too. If you make assumptions that every point is independent of every other point, you can make calculations along the front. Assume a certain time step, right? These calculations are good for five hours or something. That can tell you how far the fire is going to go. And you manually, manually propagate the fire. Well, it didn't take long before people said, well, that's pretty slow and that's very inefficient. And so what we're going to need are spatial fuel information, spatial fuel databases in order to help uh, automate this process, okay, and before the land fire uh, program, land fire is a, is a nationally supported program that, that updates and maintains uh, coverage, entire coverage for the United States of fuel models and other fuel characteristics. Before that, what we had to do is produce CDs for every little area, right? There wasn't, the internet didn't exist, and certainly there wasn't a national program to do this. So if you're going to have a model that you're going to apply everywhere, you're going to have to be able to feed it, to feed it with information, right? So the better your model is, more information it takes. Another one of the, the requirements here, and uh, Dominguez talked about this earlier, um, is assumption about the fire shape. Since the Rothermel spread equation only applies to the forward spread rate, just to the heading fire, how are you going to get the spread rate in all the different directions to, uh, to, to get, get a fire growth model? Well, remember I mentioned the remarkable scaling of the shape from tiny little fires all the way up, right? And, and the ellipse is the most simple and robust approximation to that. And, and so basically, using empirical equations, you can relate the shape of the fire, the length to breadth ratio, 
of, the, of, a, of a fire, an elliptical fire, to the wind speed. And that's what this is. So this is how we go from a spread rate calculation in one dimension to a two-dimensional fire growth simulation. So this whole thing, this, this entire process, has de generated hundreds of different applications and embedded the Rothman spread equation and all of the other attendant uh, kinds of research is embedded in lots and lots and lots of different models. And Chris Lautenberger later this afternoon is going to talk about some very sophisticated implementations of the, these same things uh, broadly across the United States. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Chris will do that pretty sure, right? Got it. Okay. So, uh, but I want to I want to point out that a lot of this stuff is very intensive. Okay, this is Monte Carlo. We use this the same kinds of models um, to do Monte Carlo simulations and for hundreds of millions of times, right? So the practical demand for this is specifies that we have to have very fast running models. I mean, if you're doing hundreds of millions of fires and billions and billions of calculations across the entire United States. You've got to have models that run quickly, I mean almost instantaneously, if you want to be able to do it. Rothman spread equation is, it's very simple. It's wrong physically, but it's still a very useful model, okay? And so if we're going to have a physically based model that replaces that, it's got to do the same thing and just as quick, maybe even faster. That's the challenge, right? So limitations of current models, a lot of this has been talked about. I'll just briefly touch on it, but Jason's going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, they're empirical. They can't be extended, so we can't just fix one piece of it. Um, they're steady state, right? They're not dynamic, as Dominguez had said. Um, we don't have thresholds in spread. Uh, you know, we assume the fire is going to spread without wind or without the slope, and then we add the wind and the slope effect. Okay, that, that's not really how it is. The fire may not spread even with the wind. Um, so acceleration, we saw the point and line fires and how different those are. don't have any way of dealing with that, you know, internally in the models. They're, they're mainly developed for the simplest kind of fuel, that is homogeneous, shallow, uh, dead fuel complexes. But that's anything but normal in wildlands, right? Lots of different configurations with this, spatial mixtures of gaps, large woody material um, for this residual burning that Guillermo talked about, um, live vegetation, of course, um, and, very, and constant weather winds. Nothing's ever constant in, in uniform. But yet, that's what the steady-state uh, steady state model will assume. So these challenges that we're facing um, and trying to overcome for advancing fire modeling in a physical way, that we, we don't just need a physical model. I mean, there's a lot of physical models out there. I'll talk about that in just a second. But there, there's a, we don't just need a model. We need an explanation. As the Forest Service, we have to conduct training and education of our people. We have to explain how things happen, not just say, trust me, this model works, you know. That, that's not good enough. That black box approach is it. So if we're going to have a physical model and we're going to take all the trouble and all the expense to update what we're doing, we better darn well be able to explain how it actually happens. Um, and we don't actually understand all those things, right, especially the dynamical aspects of it. So we need it to be efficient, very uh, economical, robust to uncertainty. So if you've ever tried doing fire modeling for, uh, for planning, but certainly for operations on an active fire, you, know, you don't have the time, right? They need an answer this afternoon. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be involved and be helpful, you have to make that calculation quickly without complete information. And if you can't do that, then just leave, you know? You, you've got to be able to do that practically. And the people who have to do this are not people like in the room, okay? They are not experts in fluid mechanics or combustion or any of that stuff. They are firefighters by and large. They don't have that background. So how do you make a tool that they can use to do this that's based on physics? That's, that's a tough challenge, okay? So it's not that it hasn't been attempted before. Andrew Sullivan did a nice job of rounding up these models um, as of 2009. And it's a great paper. It talks about them in detail and how they work. But I, I think one sentence in there is noteworthy. Identification and formulation of the processes involved in the behavior of wildland fire is problematic. Well, you got 19 different versions of physics here, okay? What is, you know, what is the physics of that? And we don't know. We got models, but no explanation, no solid proof. So, you know, a, a one way of looking at the challenge here, before I conclude, is that higher dimension models usually sacrifice resolution for performance, right? And so in order to get the thing to run fast over the domain for that purpose, you coarsen it up. You have fewer cells, fewer computations. And so... 3D models are slower than 2D models, which are a lot slower than 1D models. All right, but the big problem is, is that the physical fidelity 
really has a strong nonlinear relation to the resolution. Most of the physics is taking place at millimeter and millisecond levels, right? And, and it's been mentioned by almost every speaker here is that that's a big challenge for a wildland fire. How do you go from the scale at which the processes are taking place up to the scale that you care about? We care about kilometers and hours, right? And we can't just brute force it. We don't have the computing to do it, and we wouldn't have the data to do that either. So how do you do that? So that's where you have to be really clever. So here are the model objectives, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jason, right? We want it high resolution. We want to represent the physics at the scale at which people can see it. Clear physical process. We want to be able to explain it to our folks. Sim simplest formulation possible. So it's going to neglect a lot of information, probably most of it. But what, what are the salient elements that have to be there? That's what we want to know. Parsimonious, the most parsimonious model that gives us the most uh, output. Okay, very fast running. We want to deal with all of the comp. The, 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 the compromise and limitations that the Rothman spread equation gives us, but we want it to be just as fast and just as easy. Very broad uses. You've seen all those applications. So, okay, I'm going to step aside, and Jason is going to take over, and he's going to talk about uh, an approach to this. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I want to say I completely agree with Mark that uh, that this course has been amazing for for us. I know the instructors. I think I think everyone would agree, and hopefully for the students. Um, I have to say, so I have a background in mechanical engineering, but not in um, fire protection engineering or any of this. And so you guys should feel really lucky, in my opinion, that you have super smart people like Arno to teach you this stuff. I had to try to learn a lot of this stuff on my own, which is, that sucks. <laughs> um, so one other thing that, to, that you should know about my background is that um, in addition to being a fire researcher at the Missoula Fire Science Lab, I've been a firefighter for the last 27 years. I know I don't look that old, but uh, since I was 18, I, I, in the college, when I was going to college um, in the summers, I took a summer job with the Forest Service as a firefighter, and Mark still lets me go out on fires today. And that experience has really uh, been amazing for my research, you know, because I get to both observe a lot of fires and a lot of fire behavior and watch how fire spreads and things. But as important or maybe more important, I also get to observe firefighters and how they behave, how they make decisions, um, the problems that they face. And so that's really helped us, um, you know, and that's probably part of the reason why we, Mark and I in our group, is so focused on actually building um, an operational model, a useful model that firefighters could use, you know. So get started, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So uh, a few years ago, uh, Mark and I and our group started thinking about building a new model. We, we've been using the Rothamo model for a really long time. And this is kind of some of the thinking that went into this, the next few slides. You know, the first thing I was like, I know a lot of people have been working on this for over the 50 years, and there are a lot of models out there. Why aren't we using these other models to replace this old Rothenmill model that has all kinds of deficiencies that Mark said? And so in my mind, I'm trying to kind of learn about what's going on here, and these are some of the reasons, I think. Um, how, it, it's hard to tell. How, how could we tell? There's so much variability in wildland fire. We, we don't have a lot of good data about what happens in the field. You know, we can see where a fire spreads maybe these days with drones and things pretty well. But we don't know all the conditions, you know, the fuel conditions and the weather conditions that cause the fire to spread there. So it's really hard to tell. If we did have a better model than Rothermel's model, it would still be, it might still be hard to tell if it was better or not because of that. And, you know, so in the laboratory, we do work there. A lot of us do work there. And the laboratory, we're limited in, in our scale and things. And so that limits a lot of what we can do. But the advantage of that is that we can control the environment better. Um, we go out in the field, as you've seen a lot of people talk about, and we do as well. And uh, so that's great because you can look at things at the more larger scale where the, the, the phenomena really occur. Um, but the downside is that there's all this variability there. So um, another thing about other model, other models and comparing to Rotham Mills is that in a, a problem that I, I see at least is it seems like people, it was mentioned at a talk earlier, but people compare their model to um, a small range of conditions and only spread rate usually. And it's very easy with these models. They're so complex. There's so many 
knobs and dials. It's not too hard to tune your model to match the spread rate, you know, of a few of a few experiments or something. But um, often, and we do the same thing. I think you get the right answer for the wrong reasons at times, and so that's been a problem too. So um, one of the hopes that we we want to, or one of the pr things we want to do to try to get around that a little bit or do better than that is to also validate not just the spread rate, but uh, the processes that cause the spread. So the heat transfer and the heat up of the particle and the burning rate and things. If we can validate all that, we can have a better idea that our model's working correctly. So the next thing that I did is I said, well, let's start looking at some of these models. Why aren't we using these models to replace Rothermel? And so um, just go real quick through this and uh, just for time. But um, so in Australia and Canada, it's been mentioned, they use very like fully um, empirical models there. And there are some advantages there, but um, if you have a wide range of conditions like we do in the U.S., um, you know, lots of different kinds of fuel and things, it's hard to gather good data to get really, really good empirical models. And so there's problems there. So we decided not to go that route. Um, there's a few, I'm just picking a few models here. And there's all of these models I should mention. Maybe I don't mean to be negative. There's lots of really good work in a lot of these, but, but we're not using these models for some reason. And so Pagny and Peterson is just one example of that. Um, when I looked at that model, one of the, a couple of the main problems that I saw there were um, they assumed from the beginning, and a lot of people have done this, and I think it's a big failure. Viegas, uh, Dominguez Viegas and I were talking about earlier, um, initially assuming that there is a steady spread rate. You know, so developing your fire spread model and writing equations that give you, expect that there is a single steady spread rate for the conditions, right there, that assumption can shoot down your whole model and, and kind of wreck your whole model, in my opinion, um, because um, there may not be a steady spread rate. We see acceleration and things, even with uniform constant conditions. And so the thermally thin assumption, we've heard some discussion of that, that a lot of wildland fuels are probably not thermally thin. Ku um, in 2005 had a, a, a really great paper um, that was a heat transfer based yet fast running type of a model. It wasn't a fully closed model because they um, used the measured flame length in their, as an input to the model there, but um, you know the point wasn't here to make a closed model. Um, so um, actually they had a, I was reading over it last night and they had a really great comment in there in the paper. This is from the paper. They said this is an inherently oversimplified model, but hopefully it may play some role in the efforts of the U.S. State Forest Service to revise their operational models. And actually we use a lot of pieces of what Q did for their heat transfer analysis in this model that I'm going to talk about. So I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Another model, Frank Albini, who is an extremely smart researcher, um, tried to develop a crown fire model. And one of the, so he assumed that there was a steady spread again, which may have, I think, caused some problems in his model. Um, but also, he assumed that radiant heating was the only heating mechanism and didn't include any convective heating. And he had his reasons for that, but I, but I think that, that that was a problem because in most all of our spreading fires, both radiant and convective heating are important. So, so there was a big push by the Forest Service and some uh, researchers in Australia, Anderson Catchpole and Butler. Brett Butler was my supervisor when I first started at the lab. In the early late 90s, early 2000s, they went about specifically to build a model to replace the Rothermel model, and and they they basically kind of failed in the end. And I started looking into this, and this these plots from their paper here are are one of the main. I remember looking at these plots, and these are one of the reasons why I went about the way that I did in building this new model. I was looking at this, and they're trying to build a kind of empirically yet heat transfer based model. And one of the, a couple of the parameters that they needed in their model that were coming from empirical information was this maximum uh, gas temperature in the flames from experiments and also this um, characteristic heating distance forward of the fire. And you see the massive amount of spread there. You know, the max temperature might be 600 or it might be over 1200 Kelvin here. Yet they fit a curve through there and I thought, that could be a problem. <laughs> that's, that's too much spread. There must be missing things there. 
And so just, they've been talked about quite a bit, and I think we're gonna have some more discussion about CFD models. There's awesome stuff in the CFD models, and they really have advantages when it comes to the fluid dynamics, um, but they are very computationally costly, right? And so for an operational model at this point, it's really not very feasible. And, and then there are also other um, things that should be looked at in there, and, it, and I know it sounds like there's some really good new work being done there as far as um, like sub things that are happening at, at the sub grid because often we can't um, you know resolve a lot of these processes very well and then the last one is just this um, category of the coupled atmosphere models where they use um, a weather model for the atmospheric um, fluid dynamics the wind including wind that's generated by the fire the buoyancy of the fire but the fire spread model is usually not uh, a heat transfer based mechanistic approach, but more like a Rothamel model. And so that has a lot of the same issues as the Rothamel model that's built into there that Mark mentioned before. So for me, some of the keys to uh, developing a better model that may actually be able to replace the Rothamel model as an operational model that we could use is that it needs to be very simple, yet good enough in quotes to represent the most important spread processes. And we still need to figure out what those are. Um, it needs to be, it should be physically based, I think, because if it's, the idea there is if it's physically based and we do a good job describing the most important physics, we can use our laboratory data well at a much smaller scale, but we have some hope that um, the same physical processes that are occurring in our lab are occurring at the larger scale. So it's my the hope that um, physically based means it can, it, there's more hope that it can scale to the large, larger um, field scale. Um, the other, the other thing is that, like I said before, we need to be able to validate the, the fire spread principles. So the the pieces that cause fire spread: heat transfer, particle ignition, combustion. Um, we need to use high quality data in a wide range of conditions, because a lot of researchers have, you know, just compared to a small range of conditions. And like I said before, a lot of times it's it's not too hard to tune your model to the small range of conditions but those same tuning parameters might not work over in this range over here, that's important. You need to resolve the important spread processes and it, it needs to be useful operationally. So computationally um, easy to run quick. So, so I'm gonna to transition to talking about a, a model that we're developing right now. It's still in development and we're still working on it. There's some really promising pieces of it. And um, so I'll say, um, we're very biased because we're working on this model and we think this is the right way. But um, even if you disagree with our approach, I hope that there are pieces in here that, that you can appreciate and maybe use in the work that you're doing and some of the, the ideas that we're using here. So, so here's um, how we're building this model. So it's a, it's a one dimension, one spatial dimensional model. So if we have a side view looking at some fuel and you'll notice the fuel is clumpy with gaps and clumps of fuel here. What we do is we build a grid like any uh, numerical person would do. Um, some control volume boxes, um, just one line of them there. And then in those boxes, we pretend that there are little fuel particles in those boxes. And uh, those, and we're going to allow in our model that a control volume can contain different kinds of particles. So different size particles as shown here, or maybe even particles with different thermal properties, like different conductivity or density or moisture or something. So we're going to allow for a mix of these different kinds of particles. And then we're, we're going to um, do a one dimensional, we're gonna um, calculate the heat transfer to these particles and compute the heat up and ignition and combustion of these particles, of course. So the way we're going to do that is we're not going to assume that they're thermally thin to start. And maybe, maybe we could later. Maybe there are approximations in certain ranges where thermally thin is fine. But we're going to do a one-dimensional conduction um, type calculation. So we're going to allow for some thermal gradients and moisture gradients in the particle. So um, let's pretend that there's this fire spreading now. And uh, if you look here, you'll see that I should do this here so everyone in the other room can see. So the fire is spreading from left to right. So behind the fire, you can see that there are gray particles. That means they're completely burned out. 
Um, we're not, at first, we're not going to account for smoldering combustion, just flaming combustion in the gas phase. So in the flaming zone, there are a bunch of particles that are ignited. There's these red particles. Um, the ignition is going to occur in as simple of a method as possible. You've heard a lot about ignition. We're just going to use, to start with, a surface ignition temperature. So when we hit that temperature, um, we're going to say the particle ignites. So once the particle ignites, now we have to somehow account for how long it's going to burn for and how it's going to release its energy right, in the gas, the gas phase. And so there's a lot of different ways to do this, but we want something relatively simple. So we've heard about a lot of really cool, um, you know, really physically process driven methods and we're actually working with Arnaud on some, some really um, cool and potentially really useful um, physically based modeling of the actual burning rate of these particles. But for now, um, until we get a little farther along with that work, we have a very simple model um, where we just compute the flame residence time. So the residence time, you know, is just how long um, will a particle burn apart once it ignites. And we're also going to make a very simple assumption that um, it releases its energy as it's burning for that residence time um, uniformly. And we're um, also going to just assume that there's a fraction of the total energy that's contained in the particle that burns in the flaming zone. And then there's some in the smoldering that we're going to neglect. And there's some ash back there. And, and so that's how we're going to handle it. A very simple way for now. So our residence time model, um, one point, one really cool point about residence time. So you'll see that um, there are all these kind of main pieces of, of this coupled model that, that causes fire spread. There's heat transfer and flame geometry and, and, you know, the heat up of the particle and things. But one of these pieces is the residence time. And all of these other pieces are, we've found, are very coupled together. You perturb one little piece and it changes all the other pieces and they're really coupled. With one exception, the residence time, which is really cool. And this is like a place to attack this problem, I think, <laughs> this whole coupled problem is, and to exploit a little bit, is that the residence time doesn't, at least in the range that we looked at, doesn't seem to be a function of how fast the fire is spreading, the weather conditions, like the wind speed or anything like that, um, but only a function of the bed properties, basically. So the size of the fuel particle, um, the packing, you know, the denser you pack a bed, um, the slower it will burn, the longer the residence time, and then the moisture content. And so we're using right now a very simple empirical model derived from a bunch of experiments that, that Mark put together. But that uh, the fact that that residence time is is not uh, doesn't change with like wind speed and things is pretty amazing to me. We really want to look into this with Arno and, and his numerical model and try to actually figure out what. Why is that? Maybe there are processes that are canceling each other out because um, we learned earlier that you know there's a lot of things that the heat flux to the particle, the oxygen concentration, the things that control the burning rate. And it seems like some of those things would change with different, say, wind speed and things. But so if we have our burning particles, we can add up all the energy that's being released by the particles down here in the flaming zone. Uh, we can also determine the depth of the flames. And from the energy release rate and the flame zone depth, uh, we can use an empirical correlation to get a flame length. And uh, I'll just note that um, often people neglect the flame zone depth, but Mark's been doing some work um, with our lab, uh, empirical work, and, and we've seen and looked back at some work by Thomas and others that actually uh, flame zone depth can matter to your um, calculation of flame length. So often people just use the fire line intensity to go straight from fire line intensity, energy being released to flame length. But um, in certain ranges, the flame zone depth is very important. So if we know the geometry of the flames, we can do some somewhat simple heat transfer calculations. So first we uh, talk about radiant heat transfer. We account for two different modes. One is um, radiation from the flame, which we assume is basically like a plate there. Um, the emissivity, and this comes from KU 2005, so we use a view factor type calculation, you know, the heat, heat flux to 
to a particle is kind of the view factor kind of thing to that particle. Um, we do account for the emissivity of the flame changing as it gets smaller. We also do a calculation for bed radiation. So these glowing particles inside the flame zone are transferring heat forward using kind of an idea of um, like an optical depth of how far that radiation penetrates. And then this is a really important piece right here. And this is a piece of the convective forward heat transfer. So those hot gases that are moving forward um, to heat up these particles in a, you know, a turbulent way with cross-flow wind. Um, typically, people write would, you, you, one way to do that would be, would be with CFD, <laughs> but that's too costly for what we're trying to do here. So uh, Mark's done a lot of this work, and this is a really big piece of the puzzle of this model is we're using a pretty interesting uh, empirical approach basically to the forward heat transfer. So we did a lot of stationary burner experiments with different geometries of burners and cross flow winds and slopes and energy release and had a bunch of thermocouples, really tiny thermocouples out there and measured um, that basically the distribution of hot gases with time over distance away from different geometry <coughs> flames in different conditions. And so that, that's our real shortcut, computational shortcut that we're using in this model to make it much faster than like a CFD model. So here's some examples of um, some of the parameters that, um, that affect the forward convective heating. Um, and I don't have time to really get into that, so we'll just move on there. There's a few examples of some of the burners that we used. Oh videos. So one last thing before we start looking at the, the, the results of some of the, these simulations and how, how the model behaves. This is a really important piece is that the idea that this model, so we didn't assume that um, this there was a steady spread, steady spread rate of the fire. Um, we're going to allow these processes that cause spread to naturally evolve and allow the fire to do what it's going to do and spread, accelerate, go out, do whatever it's going to do based on the physical processes that we think um, cause the fire to spread. So this coupled nonlinear system that is fire spread is really interesting and we're going to look at some examples of that and there was discussion earlier about that. So here's uh, just some real simple output of um, the model spreading fire down um, a, a bed of, of, say, pine needles. And it doesn't really matter the conditions and things, but just the behavior. So maybe let's first focus on the, so this is time on the x-axis, and this is the flame front position over time. Um, and you can see, it, you know, it moves down the bed to uh, a 10 meter long bed. Um, the slope of that line is the spread rate of the fire. And so you can see, this is interesting. So right here, this is something that, this is different than Rother Mill. Rother Mill would just give us one spread rate for these conditions. But we see, as uh, Dr. Viegas was mentioning, that things change over time. Even though the conditions here, you know, the wind speed, the fuel, everything was constant, um, but the spread rate changes over time. You know, it, it eventually, in this case, equilibrates to, and maybe over 40 or so seconds to a constant spread rate, but it does accelerate. And you can see some of the other variables there, the flame length and things. So now let's look at something a little more interesting. And so this is, uh, for some reason, these or this, these ones down here are supposed to be plotted as dashed lines, but they don't. Um, so let's focus on these lines up here. And so this is uh, three different fires spreading in all the same conditions, except um, the only difference is different fuel loadings for each of these. And we're just plotting the spread rate over time here. And you'll see um, this first case of a kind of rather light loading um, does what we just saw. It kind of accelerates to a steady spread rate and stops. Um, the, the heavier loading fuel beds have this really interesting overshoot of the steady spread rate and then uh, kind of a damped oscillation, I would call it to a steady spread rate, right? And so this goes back to a lot of what that big discussion earlier, <laughs> um, I think, and, and uh, so just one point about this, that uh, there are no um, 
fluctuations into this system that are that are entered by the you know the boundary conditions, the inputs to the system. So there's no fluctuating wind here, or anything like this. And even the way we're handling the convective heating forward, even though that's a turbulent flame fluctuating and flapping around and things, um, we're not handling it that way in this system. We're for now using just a steady mean uh, temperatures with distance down for the convective heating, but the point is that this coupled system that causes fire to spread here, even this simple system that we've designed, has these really interesting oscillating behaviors. It's really cool. Um, you know, there's some ideas of how what's going on here that we have, and we haven't had time really to really look into this. I really want to look into what's causing, say, the, the frequency, you know, the frequency of these fluctuations, the amplitude, uh, like was discussed uh, Dr. Viegas earlier, these things to really delve into this and see what 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 um, causes some of this. Off the you know from initial look at some of this, we do know that um, I think the residence time is a really big thing here. And one way to think about this is uh, how fast the front of the fire is spreading and how fast the back of the fire is spreading, right? And the distance between them is the flame zone depth. But if we think of some of these fires, so remember that. In these residence time is constant. So if this is if there's a fire spreading this way and this is the front of the fire, once this piece of fuel ignites, there's sort of a timer there. It's going to burn for 30 seconds or something. Um, so the front of the fire is spreading. So if you start a fire here and you track the front and the back of the fire moving that way, the front of the fire is going to accelerate as we saw. The back of the fire is going to stay there for a while until it starts burning out. And then think about it. The back of the fire, the movement of the back of the fire is identical to the movement of the front of the fire in this case, except it's lagged in time. And the lag in time is that residence time, right? So it's going to, it's almost like a, a spring or a slinky. It's going to accelerate and then that's going to accelerate. And so when it accelerates, uh, you get a big flame zone depth. You get a lot of energy being released compared to the wind that's there. That's steady. Maybe the flames stand up, the heat transfer reduces. The fire spread rate slows down, um, the back catches up, all of a sudden the flames are smaller, maybe the wind now can push the flames over, heat the, the fuel faster, cause the leading edge to spread faster, and you seem to get this damped oscillation. It's pretty cool. So we've been burning fires in our lab for over 60 years, I think, now in our lab, and no one's noticed this um, because we weren't looking for it, I think. So, so we, I want to do some experiments in the future to really look, look at this to, to validate some of this work. But here's some at least anecdotal evidence from our lab from some past work that's been done. And this is spread rate at different positions down the fire. So it's not time there, but it's similar. And you see this, um, at least this overshoot and maybe, a, maybe even an oscillation there. The, these are several different burns. The mean is that red line there. So that's the average. Of, of these burns that were all under the same conditions. So it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm gonna skip over this, maybe. There we go. So let's look at some other behaviors of, the, of this model. Um, Mark was showing the first slide Mark had, looking at uh, two different fires, a big line fire and a point fire ignited in exactly the same conditions. The Rothermel model would predict the same spread rate for both of those, but we saw the one spreads like three times faster than the other. It has to do with um, heat transfer, maybe radiant, but also definitely convective heating differences with a long line of fire versus a small width of fire. So this is, um, our model can at least represent some of these effects here. Um, so this is uh, spread rate over time of uh, four different fires uh, spreading with different widths of a fuel bed that they're spreading down. And you can see the wider bed spreads faster. Uh, so the model can also handle the way it works since it's stepping in time. We could change some of the conditions in time if we wanted to, if we knew how. So this is just one kind of example of what you could do. This is if we could just, if we just fluctuate the wind sort of artificially in time, we just chose a sine wave here, not because that's how wind actually fluctuates, but just to demonstrate the model. So the blue line there shows um, the fluctuations that we imposed in the ambient wind. And you can see the response of the model. The red is the spread rate, you know, like you might expect the spread rate goes up and down. 
Uh, remember how I talked about the, the slinky kind of effect of the front and the back of the fire and things? You kind of see an effect of that in the flame zone depth. You know, it's not just a, it's not just like a sine wave kind of thing there. It's got some kind of a kink to it and some flattened off and it's different. And I think if you look really close, you might be able to see some shifts in time in some of this. So this is all stuff that, um, you know, we really need to investigate further. Um, let's see, we're looking at slope. So, so we did the same thing with slope. So the model can operate with um, slope. We did a bunch of heat transfer experiments looking at convective heating in front of flames on slopes. Um, this is showing, so this is showing uh, another pretty important aspect of the model, at least at the model, and I don't know how accurate it is at this point. We still have a lot of validation work to do, but at least this framework, one cool thing about the idea of um, not assuming that there is a steady spread rate of the fire is that it allows for the case of um, where the fire can't spread. And whether that's because it's too wet, the moisture content's too high, or you'll see in a second, you have fuels with gaps and the fire can't spread across the gaps. There's lots of different reasons why um, a fire might not be able to spread uh, in, in certain conditions. The Rothermo model will always give you a spread rate. The way the equations work, no matter what you input into it, it will give you a spread rate, even when in reality the fire won't spread. And so the model is just showing this. These dots show where our model is predicting that the fire won't spread. So at a high moisture content with a high wind up here, you, you can get the fire to spread. But um, if you reduce the wind, eventually the fire can't spread in those conditions. That's what this is showing. So this is an example of our model handling the one dimension that we do uh, resolve in our one dimensional spatial model. So along the spread of the, of the direction of the fire, we can vary the fuel there and we can pretty much put whatever kind of fuel we would want. Here's an example of just a periodic fuel patch and then a gap in a fuel patch. And we're gonna look at um, fire spreading through a fuel type like this and we're gonna play around with the gap lengths, the size of the gaps, and the size of the patches. And so let's just look at this one, the, these, the top case up here with five meters per second wind. And so you see the same thing basically, that um, this is just the mean spread rate at these different points. So um, under a uh, fuel patch length of let's say 0.5, um, the fire will spread until the gaps get to be bigger than, say, 0.25. When you have bigger gaps than that, it won't spread anymore. It's the same thing with different, you know, different conditions. So you, you might ask about validation. I would. <laughs> and that's basically, it. that's really a big to-do for us right now. We've done a bunch of attempts at validation. We're still working on development of the model. So just throwing up some, some of these plots. Th these will change and, you know, it's not too bad. There's definitely a spread in a lot of cases and I, it's really something I wanna look into, like what, and try to figure out what is causing this spread. And we're gonna do some really detailed experiments trying to really get down, like I mentioned, to the heat transfer and things that are going on, um, hopefully soon. So, uh, so hopefully with those experiments, like we can start to understand why are we under predicting, over predicting this? We must be doing something wrong or not accounting for something that's important. And so trying to, trying to narrow that stuff down is definitely on the list of something we want to do. Um, I just mentioned the computational cost of the model and, and something that we're doing. Uh, so the model that I just showed, we call it the 1D model, or it also has a name called the light fire model. <laughs> uh, takes about, it takes, it depends on your settings like any numerical model, but in the range of, on a normal laptop computer that you have today sitting here, uh, like seconds, tens of seconds, maybe a minute or something, it depends. And, and that's also, I'll say, without a lot of real optimization. We, since we're still in development, we haven't done a lot of optimization. I think that'll reduce quite a bit when, when we really put an effort in that direction. But uh, as Mark maybe kind of mentioned, or maybe you saw, 
the way these models, like say the router mill model, gets used operationally, um, often people don't just do like one run of the Rother mill model, which is really fast. If that was all we were doing, we could actually run this 1D model that I just showed you a few seconds. That's no big deal. But um, when the Rother mill model, or maybe this model someday, gets embedded in these systems like Farsight or a thing called FS Pro, looking at spread probabilities and things, and these ensemble Monte Carlo um, types of simulations, e even one analysis by a firefighter might be running the Rothermel model like a million times or more during that. And so even this model, this 1D taking seconds per run model is going to be too computationally expensive. So um, we're, we've been working with Google. It's been um, really awesome to work with those guys, some extremely smart people that we were working with and very, very good at this machine learning AI type stuff. And uh, the idea there is, uh, and, I, and I think this is, you know, I, I, I don't probably even have to say this to you guys, but some of this AI stuff could be really useful for all kinds of different things. It's really kind of like a curve fit, I think. But, <laughs> but uh, this idea of a sort of surrogate model. And so we've already been working with them to, to apply this. This shows some examples of, so um, we run the 1D physically based model that I showed you, say, uh, and we've done this, they've done it with their big computational resources that they have billions of times. So say we vary the input parameters over wide ranges, a pretty good resolution in the variation, and there's a lot of different parameters, vary, do billions of simulations, and then allow the, the machine learning model to learn from that data set. And uh, that takes a lot of computational effort. But once the model has learned, um, actually doing a prediction from the AI model is, is very, very fast. And uh, there's some sort of, I think, kind of vector type uh, programming that they have done. So like one simulation with the AM, AI model is like 10 milliseconds. So that's probably plenty fast for a lot of the stuff that we would do. But even better, um, if you, instead of one simulation, if you want to do 50,000 simulations, let's say it's only like five times more expensive, costly in time. And so there's some programming voodoo that they're doing there to, to get that <laughs> but but that's pretty cool so that so that's really exciting i think and, and that may have application to other people's models too that are computationally expensive i mean maybe this is an approach that could be used maybe someday for like cfd type simulations or something so this is the slide that mark showed earlier about limitations of, of the Rothermill model, basically, in our current operational models. And so, so this is my interpretation of the model that we've developed. And again, it's still a work in progress, and there's still a lot of validation. And so it, it's not done, and it's not the model that's going to replace the Rothermill model or anything at this point. But, but I think there's a lot of hope there, at least from me. And uh, the cool thing is that a lot of these... Um, limitations of the current model, the Rothermill model, the operational model we use now, this new model could get rid of a lot of those limitations, which is pretty cool. And all of these pieces would be very useful to firefighters, which is cool. So I'll just give a few examples. I won't go through all of them, but um, thresholds in fire spread. It would be extremely useful for firefighters if you're trying to predict how a fire spreads over um, a week. Maybe a fire starts in the middle of a wilderness area and the fire manager is trying to decide if maybe we should let this fire go. Maybe it's not going to go anywhere we care about. We'll save a bunch of money. Ecologically, it's good. But uh, if you're trying to simulate a fire over many, many days, it turns out that most of the time and most fires like that, the fire spreads as a flaming front for a while. And then maybe nighttime comes, the humidities come up. It goes to basically a smoldering fire. It transitions from flaming to smoldering. Um, then it picks up in the daytime and, and spreads again. Maybe it, uh, like thresholds, maybe it's spreading in brush. And there's an interesting thing about brush is that often there's a, it takes a certain amount of wind and often a certain amount size of existing fire to get fire to actually spread through brush, a canopy like that, an elevated canopy. Same with the crown fire. And so um, these spread threshold, no spread threshold prediction of that would be very useful for firefighters. They can't do that right now very well, other than through just some observations and things. So I think, uh, you know, there's some really cool 
things that could come from this, a model like this at least. So some of the future plans that we have for the model, I've mentioned some already, um, but, but validation for me is a really big one, and especially the pieces of the model, the heat transfer and things. Um, this is a really big one that, that Arnaud is going to solve for us. <laughs> Um, but this is a big one that a lot of people actually don't realize. Um, you know, out in the real world, when you look at a, a fuel bed, so like a forest or something, um, there's a mixed size class. Of, there's a lot of different kinds of fuel particles out there. Most people don't know the Rothermel model can only be run for a single size class fuel bed. The experiments that were used to develop the Rothermel model, it's an empirical curve fit type model. The experiments were all single size class. So we use the Rothermel model, and there's some sort of hocus pocus that, that happens to basically convert a mixed size class fuel bed into an equivalent single size class. And, and none of that work to get the equivalent size class was ever really validated or anything. But that uh, then is put into the Rothermel model. So if so, we we really don't know, you know, how mixed size class fuel beds burn. People, there haven't been hardly any experiments done, you know, lab experiments there. So that's a huge field of work. And, and if we could predict the, the residence time um, of mixed size class fuel beds, that would be a huge advantage. And the framework of the model I showed has the ability to sort of um, grab onto a submodel like that if it was available. And so ho hopefully some future work will solve that problem. That flaming to smoldering transition I mentioned. Um, that, that would be awesome to be able to do that and very useful for firefighters if we could. Live fuels. Um, there was talk earlier and Sarah had some really good video from our labs and just live fuels are so, I mean, that's a huge field of study that hasn't hardly been touched, you know, and they don't burn just like dead, dead wet fuels. There's like these explosions and different things that go on with how they release their moisture. Also maybe um, some volatiles and things that are in there. Um, but that is a needed piece for sure. Uh, crown fire spread, that's been mentioned in the past, and we really don't have a very good model of how crown fire spread, and so there may be potential for this model or a model like this to do even crown fire spread, we think. Um, there's maybe some other ways to handle the fluid dynamics that are happening in the model, still fast, but maybe in a more physically based way. I'd love to be able to do that, so there's different, several different ideas we have for that to be working on. Um, an extension to 2D is something that Mark's been working on recently. So the, these, if you look at that video right there, Mark's been in our lab trying to basically develop some more empirical curves for the forward convective heating um, of line fires burning, not, you know, not just a heading fire perpendicular to the wind, but at different angles, and maybe that could be incorporated. And the cool thing about that is, and we've started playing around with it, is um, we wouldn't need to rely then on that empirical elliptical shape that we do right now to go from a 1D Rothermel type model to the two dimensions, the ellipse. So that'd be cool. Um, yeah, I think I'll skip. Oh, the last one's an important one I'll, I do want to mention, is that... Uh, in addition to what you all probably imagine the uses of a new model like this would be to, to run, to simulate fires and things like that, there's another use for this model that maybe you don't realize that's at least as big as um, the actual model and running it to predict fire spread, and that is to use it uh, to train our firefighters better. So the, all the, the, so I'll say... 99.9% .9 of all fire behavior predictions that happen on fires by firefighters to make decisions like where they're going to put a fire line or put people is done right here in their heads. They don't run these models to, to try to decide what they're going to do for the most part. They're, they're run in different ways that I don't really have time to explain right now. But, um, but uh, so, so our fire behavior training that we give firefighters right now is really based on what we, our knowledge of fire behavior, which at the time that the classes were developed, was basically Rothermel. Rothermel's description of fire behavior and his model was sort of like the knowledge that was used to, to train firefighters. And so there's a lot, as you saw, there's a lot of 
issues with that, you know, a lot of, a lot of problems. And so our hope is that um, this new model and the knowledge that comes from it about how fires spread, the accelerations, all these different things could be used in the training. That, that training is really a huge piece, especially for firefighter safety, which is a really big thing for me. So uh, that's the end of my talk. I think we have time for some questions, don't we, Arno? Yeah. We have time for questions. Yes, please. Yep. So I have two interrelated questions. See in your model, how do you take into account, or can you take into account uh, stability in the atmosphere? Because Craig Clements' model said like directional shear, how like chaotic it is. Mm -hmm. No, so you know, right now we don't. Our model, we we just assume at the you know at the flame scale, I'll call it the scale of the heat transfer that's going on in the near field um, buoyant flows that are happening. I I don't know how important or not like a stable or an unstable atmosphere would be there. We we don't handle it right now, but I do. Um, I'm not. I don't know how that might um, affect that, that, you know, I, I feel like it's a secondary effect at that point. If you have, you know, if the wind at that point, um, say the mid flame wind say is a certain speed, you know, and then you just, you hold that constant, but you say vary the atmospheric stability and everything else is constant too, especially the moisture content. Um, I feel like the fire is going to sp spread about the same, you know, but, but don't get me wrong. There are at times these large scale bloom type behaviors where um, all the buoyancy from the fire, you know, not just the fire line scale, but from the whole fire burning in different places around there um, do affect the local things that are happening. So, so there are effects that happen there, um, you know, all the way to the scale of um, uh, more weather type things that can happen like a thunderstorm. So, you know, a fire, a fire can um, build up enough, put up enough moisture in the air and enough lift in the air to generate basically like a thunderstorm. You know, you get really interesting um, condensation of moisture, cloud, water, rain type dynamics, um, you know, and downbursts coming from, from those moisture processes and even lightning can happen. And so, so don't get me wrong. There are definitely fire scale effects that sometimes happen and can be very important. And okay. you know, that this model would not be able to account for that. to this uh, is, I think it's useful also to put this question in the context of, of scales. Yeah. And so, what the model that Jason and, and uh, describe is a model that describes the, the flame behavior. So you have meter scale. I mean, the flame can be mm -hmm. maybe at the level of a tree when you have a quant fire. So but you're looking at 10 meter, 20 meter flame, uh, you know, max. The uh, unstable nature uh, um, of the, the atmospheric boundary layer you uh, on an unstable temperature gradient is something that works at the level of, uh, you know, hundreds of meters. Okay, so that's different scale. And so this model, and we will see an example of that with uh, Chris Lautenberger's presentation this afternoon, is a piece that goes into a long, long scale, uh, uh, scale model, or regional scale model, that will account for the weather. And so the way this is, this feedbacks into the model of the spread is through this wind velocity that comes from somewhere. So this wind velocity will be affected by larger scale behavior and can be modified by the unstable nature of the atmosphere. So, so there is this coupling. But at the level of what uh, Jason described, the wind velocity is assumed to be known. And at that level, there is nothing else that you have to add to that physics. Yeah, I agree with Arno. There's almost kind of a scale separation. Ho you, right. you hope for a, a way to sort of um, a shortcut to model the process, these two processes. If they're very different scales, maybe you can be successful with two different models, you know, one model just feeding the other model to predict it instead of a one whole model for for the kind of continuum of connected scales. You know, maybe there's a kind of scale separation there so you can model them more separately. Four fires, I don't know. Yeah. 
Uh, I think you had the second question. Yeah, so you were quoting wind speeds there. I assume these are to come from tunnels. So if you apply this to the landscape, you're probably taking a measurement from a power. Mm -hmm. How do you, what wind speed do you use? And is there a profile you have to use to interpret that affects the fire? Yeah, so at this point, you know, our, I'll say our convective forward heating model, which is where the wind is really most dominant in the model, is coming from our is empirical right and so it's coming from our data that we've been taking in our lab and so i think that you would have to go i would say you to answer that question you need to understand where that model is coming from and where that data is coming from and so uh in our lab our wind is you know there's not a very big boundary layer not not like a giant logarithmic profile like in the atmosphere and more of just uh you know a constant wind with height and so I think you, we would need to think about how to, to answer that problem and, and what effect that has. But, you know, you could attempt, I think a first order attempt would be to use uh, the, like we do with our modeling right now, kind of a log reduction or a canopy flow reduction factor, they call it wind adjustment factor, from the measurement height of maybe 10 meters or 20 feet above the vegetation down to something like the mid-flame wind height. And, you know, that would probably not be a bad first order attempt at accounting for that. Maybe here first. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for both talks. My question is more general, and it goes to the Monte Carlo simulations and the risk uh, workshop. How is that done? Uh, I mean, what, what is varied? What is important? Yeah. So the things that are varied are the ignition locations and the weather stream. So an analysis of historical weather is conducted that includes the, uh, the um, time series of moisture uh, variation that, you know, by spatially varied across the landscape, across the, the country, um, as well as wind, localized wind uh, variations, wind distributions of speed and direction. And so the way the Monte Carlo works is it generates artificial synthetic time series of these, this weather in order to drive the simulations from a given ignition point. And so ignitions occur based on uh, empirical functions that relate ignition to drought conditions, which are derived from the local data. Right? So we have, we have pretty good data sets showing uh, for the past, well, since, since 1982, um, or 92, showing historical ignitions, and then you also have um, overlapping weather uh, sequences for that. So you can develop this empirical correlation between likelihood of ignitions and weather conditions, right? And so when those ignitions happen throughout the year, there's a time series of uh, a sequence of different weather events that are simulated until extinguishment occurs, okay? And so then you end up with, for tens of thousands of simulated years, you end up with fire patterns that overlap to produce probability distribution. May I follow up on that? But, but all the climate analytics companies tell us that historical data is useless because of global warming. Yeah, it, the, the historical data are not useless. I mean, you, ha you have a, an inherent um, uh, stationary bias, right, in that, that if you're, if you're going all the way back to 1992, you're exactly right. So st the, the problem is we're not forecasting 10,000 years worth of fire activity, okay, it's looking at an extant uh, probability distribution, just like risk analysis is done for any peril, whether it's hurricanes or whatever. But the way that it's handled right now is that you pick only the past decade or so in order to generate the artificial weather sequences from. Okay. So you. you're exactly right. I mean, yeah, you got to be careful what baseline you, you assume. Um, so, Jason, as far as I understood, you just divide the grids, um, no matter what the height of the fuel is, you just divide it. Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a good question and about so the fuel height. What if the height changes yeah. diff across the, we... And the vertical heat mm -hmm. and mass transfer, and also, um, uh, yeah, I, I have a follow-up question. Yeah, there are some issues to deal with there. So you can, you know, enter different heights in there right now, like at different cells. But the way that the heat transfer calculated is very approximate, and, and, and you're getting to the level where it's not resolved, basically. Those, a lot of those differences in height and things like that. 
So, so definitely if there was like a big change in the fuel height, uh, spatially, horizontally, you know, at some point that's going to overwhelm the model, you know, the model, the model's not accounting for that. And um, did you validate the model for, let's say, low fuel loading with more air spaces and high fuel height? Yeah, I mean, well, validate, like I said, you know, the validation work is, we've done a bit of validation work and I showed some of it there, but it's, it's, uh, there's a, a lot of that done. We've done maybe 5% of what we need to do at this point. So, uh, but we do run it, you know, we have run it and looked at some pretty lightly loaded fuel beds, I'll say. We, we've been do you know, experimentally, um, running a lot of really lightly loaded beds with those laser cut cardboard comb beds that we've been burning recently in our lab. And so we use a lot of that data to try to validate the model. Yeah, I just, I'd add to that the, the, the title slide with the stubble field on it. The fuel loading on that is only uh, 0.3 kilograms per square meter. So very, very low. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. But you, I mean, you can go lower than that, right? But we, we don't have we don't have experimental data for things lower than that. Uh, hold on, there was a question here first. Yeah. Well, I, I want to, uh, I'm guessing that for the audience that you're trying to get to use your model, you have to work within the same framework as them, which includes, you know, weather from fire family, uh, vegetation data from land fire. Are yeah. you still within this constraint or are you planning on using... Well, I would say we are and we aren't. So I think if we had to, we could adapt the model to fit in exactly and like perfectly just drop into the existing system with... We could build sort of a crosswalk from the existing fuel models, like from land fire, to feed into here and stuff. But um, I, I don't have time to get into the background of it. the fuel models. Is a whole big issue where there's lots and lots of problems, um, and, and also there's all these different systems like far in the U.S. that operationally are used, like Farsight, Flamap, and they're they're getting to be so many because of historical reasons of how they propped up, they came about. Um, definitely, the, this this model, if we get to a point where we think it's good enough to deploy out to firefighters, is going to be a great point in time to rethink all of that. And we're starting to work on different ways to measure and, and model um, fuels. Uh, we're doing some work with Google on that, some aerial imagery and different things, and AI. And so, so I expect, and I think Mark would agree, that at the point when hopefully we do de try to deploy a model like this, there will be a big change in all of those as well. You know, we're not just going to probably just drop it into the existing stuff because there's improvements to be made in other places. So the way you define your fuel bed now is based on the one hour, ten hour classification, but not because of... Uh, yeah, the, I mean, right now we don't even bother with... Um, we, you can do whatever size you want. You know, we don't just constrain ourselves. You, you could do uh, like a 10-hour size fuel just as well as a, an 11-hour size, you know, or yeah. whatever size you want at this point. Um, yeah, so you, you could do whatever you want. Um, yeah, the, the particle yeah. properties, material properties are set by the user. So you can put in, you know, one millimeter particle, half a millimeter, anything you want. Yeah. It, is, it isn't dependent on the fuel model descriptions. Yeah. I want to mention this because this is an important thing, and I'll just I'll just touch on it. <laughs> and if people can talk later with me about it, and Mark, but most of you all probably don't know. You know, there's a this land fire data set out there, and there are these fuel models, 13 or 14. And if you look at the properties of a fuel model, um, it says it's the loading. There's this much, uh, this many pounds of one hour fuel, and this many pounds of 10 hour. And then we have these maps across the country of these patches of these fuel. If you're like me, you would expect that there was some basis for, like, people went out on the ground and actually measured fuels, the loadings of these fuels, and these maps are based on that. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. So you shouldn't believe, especially for, like, a more physically based model like we're doing right now, that because Landfire says this point has, you know, half a pound of one hour fuel and this, the, the, maybe Mark can describe it better, but... Uh, the reason that the, so the model, the Rothermel model and these fuel models and the mapping of them are sort of coupled together so that the maps were developed very subjectively 
such that people that developed them thought that the model would work appropriately there is a way to say that, <laughs> is that right? So um, there, there's, a, there's a lot that people don't know. You know, we use all these models for all kinds of different applications, mixed size class. But, and if you really, really look under the hood, you would be very surprised at, at how they actually operate. So, and so that's part of the reason why we're trying exactly to improve. Exactly right. I just one quick comment on that is that you know the the uh, I, have we talked about the subjectivity of what physical components to include in the physical model and how they're connected. Okay, there's the same level of uncertainty associated with what to describe for fuels. What are the salient properties of fuels you must describe? And how well must you describe in order to be able to use that in a physical manner. Nobody knows. So first I think we, I think it's a chicken and egg problem, but I think the first thing we have to do is understand the physics well enough and that will help us understand how important the fuel properties are, what they are, and then how important they are to measure, we'll have precisely. So we are still in this kind of, this, this cycle. Okay, I know there are, <laughs> I see a few hands, but we, we are running out of time very fast, sorry. So, I invite you to go to uh, Jason and Mark uh, during lunch, uh, but let's sing them again.